So Romans 15, 2 Timothy 3, 1 Corinthians 10, and Romans 5. And let's pray. Our God and our Father, again, Lord, I do thank you for this time with your word. And I thank you, God, because it is your word that does change people's lives. It is your word that, that will convict people of their sin. It is your word that will comfort them when they're in a time of sorrow or pain. And it is your word that brings joy to the life of the believer. And God, I pray that daily we would heed your word and follow it, that we would stay close by the side of Jesus Christ, our great shepherd. And Lord, I pray that this time now with your word would bless you, that you would be magnified and exalted and that we would carry that throughout this week, that we would seek to magnify and lift up Jesus Christ for all to see. And just as the Israelites had to look, to, look towards the fiery serpent for salvation from their bite, Lord, people need to look to Jesus Christ, lifted up and exalted for all to see in order to be saved, in order to be no longer under your condemnation or wrath. And Lord, I pray that you would open our ears and our hearts to hear your word and to follow it, that daily we would seek your wisdom and your strength. And I pray, Lord, that every day you would help us to have that renewed obedience towards you. And this I pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. All right, so Romans chapter 15, verse 4. Romans 15, verse 4. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we, through patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. So Paul, he wrote this epistle to the Roman believers to encourage them and to guide them to take up their cross and follow Jesus Christ. And the letter to the Romans is important reading for the disciple of Jesus Christ today. And truly, the entire Bible is important for the believer to read and follow. And sadly, the Old Testament is often neglected by believers for a couple of reasons. One, it has not really been taught to them other than the teaching of different events. People are familiar with the Ark and Noah, and people know the creation account. They know of David and Goliath, but sadly, they don't know much else about David's life. And they are missing out on so very much of the Bible when they do not spend much time in the Old Testament other than in the book of Psalms. Why? Because the better you know the Old Testament, the better you understand the New Testament. And I can attest to that. Growing up in the Roman Catholic Church, they didn't teach us much about the Bible. They tried to teach us to be good people, but they didn't teach us anything about the Bible. And, and I couldn't have told you how many books there were. I couldn't have told you where to find the books, New Testament, Old Testament. I didn't know. And the Bible, if I was that, that week was my week to be a lectern, their Bible was already set up, so I had the passages already planned out so I knew what to read. But nobody taught me how to pronounce Colossians or Galatians. How sad that is, that even just the very basic stuff, people don't know. But it isn't just restricted to, to the Catholic Church. I mean, when, when we went off to Bible college, and I, I've, at the college we had sons of missionaries there and daughters of missionaries there. 
They didn't know where the books of the Bible were. They had to take us back to right to the beginning, which worked well for me because I didn't know that much. But they had to teach and learn the 66 books of the Bible. How sad that a missionary's kid didn't know. So that's why the Bible is so important for people to know. And, and as Paul is talking about here, when Jesus Christ is quoting Scripture, he is quoting the Old Testament, because that is the Scripture that they had at the time. Now, as an example, studying the book of Leviticus can seem like a daunting challenge. But actually, the more I've read it, the more I gain from it, and it becomes very rewarding to read. And, and it gives you more insight into the holiness of God and the unholiness of man. And reading about the seven feasts that were conducted throughout the year gives you more depth of understanding of the Passover and the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And as we're coming up to that season, you know, where people are sort of thinking about it, at least, you know, every Friday you can find a, a fish fry on every corner. And, um, sorry, I'm still not going to eat that McFish sandwich, but um, I, 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 again, we grew up Catholic. We worked around finding things to not eat meat on. So when we have, if we had a pizza on Friday, it was with no pepperoni on it. It was just a cheese pizza. You know, we're not under that restriction. We don't have to do that. You know, but we, we can understand so much more and understand better why Jesus died on the cross and understand better who he died for by reading and knowing the Old Testament. And so Paul had written, again, look at the beginning of verse 4. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning. And these things that Paul is referring to is the Old Testament. And the Old Testament has great meaning for you and I today. You will find, sadly, many preachers that will say no. You know, we don't want the Old Testament. We want to unhitch the Old Testament. You know, there was a, a friend I had at Bible College, and we would have a chapel service every Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And if there wasn't a special speaker scheduled, the, the dean of the college would, would pick a student. But the student didn't know they were getting picked that day. And he would let them know maybe 10 minutes before chapel started you're speaking today. You had to be ready so that you had a message ready. And, and um, so I made sure I was ready with something just in case I was called. And, and I would get teased by some of my, my, especially one classmate, because it seemed to him most of my messages came from the Old Testament. And I would tease him back, you know, all your messages seem to come from the New Testament. And uh, to be honest, that seemed to carry over even when he had a pastor for a time. I checked and a lot of his messages were New Testament. You know, we need to know the Old Testament so that we can teach the New Testament. You know, and because Paul wrote for whatsoever things, that means the entire Old Testament is important for the believer today. And what is written in the Old Testament is finished, and it is written for our learning. Keep your finger here in Romans, but go over to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Second Timothy chapter 3. Some of you may have already guessed where I'd be going. Verse 16. 2 Timothy 3, 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. All 
all of the scriptures is given by inspiration of God. Not most of it or some of it, but all of the scriptures were given by inspiration of God. And sadly, you have those that will fight about even that. They will say, oh no, the only words we need to rely on are the, one, the red letter ones. Okay, if that's true, Jesus Christ, here he is quoting the Old Testament over and over and over again. Therefore, <clears throat> sure looks like I need to count on some black letter words as well in there. It's just, it's foolishness when people come up with stuff like that. God does not make any mistakes. Does God ever try to deceive you? No. He has given you the Bible, and he has preserved his word, and you can trust that it is infallible. Why? Because God gave it to us. You know, he, he is going to protect his word. He's going to show that he is true. And this is unlike the people that claim to be prophets today. They will profess that the Lord gave them a word today, a prophecy. And if the prophecy does not come to pass, well, then they will declare that they misunderstood God or that they made a mistake. How sad to treat God that way. If the Lord God of heaven was truly speaking to these so-called prophets, do you truly believe that he would allow his word to go forth erroneously? No, he would not. The Lord would make sure that the prophets were understood and that they spoke correctly what he told them to say. And think about it. If you, if you had two children and one child is next to you, the other child is off playing somewhere, and you tell the child that's in front of you, would you go get little Billy and tell him to come home in 15 minutes for supper? If, so if Susie here runs off to tell Billy, but what if Susie runs off and says to Billy, oh, mom says come home in half an hour for lunch. I think I said 15 minutes, right? Okay. You know, and, and, and Susie says, no, come home in half an hour for lunch. Why? Because she wants to get Billy in trouble. Am I going to make sure that Susie doesn't make that mistake twice? Because I'm going to make sure that my word carried to her and to Billy as well. Why would God allow a so-called prophet of God to get it wrong? He wouldn't. And he tells us that in Deuteronomy chapter 18, Old Testament. He tells us he's not going to, if a prophet of God is wrong once, he's not a prophet of God. And yet some will, will try and pull out of their hand and they'll say, oh, but... Jonah was wrong, or this one was wrong, so therefore I can be wrong. No, Jonah wasn't wrong. God is not wrong. If you get once one prophecy wrong, you're not a prophet of God. It's that simple. The Lord would always make sure that the prophets were understood and they spoke correctly what he told them to say. And the Lord God of heaven is going to preserve his word so that the man of God may be perfect, as it says, excuse me, in 2 Timothy there. <clears throat> Meaning that he can grow in maturity in the Lord. God will make sure to equip you properly so that you're furnished unto all good works. He will give you the right tools for the job that he wants you to do. Because it's tough and it's frustrating. You try to do a job, you don't have exactly the right tool for doing the job. And despite what some people think, a hammer is not always the right tool for a job. It just isn't going to work. And, and, and yet people will try everything else. Our responsibility, your responsibility, is to use the tools that he gives you and then put in the time to be prepared to use those tools. For example, you would not give a five-pound hammer to a six-year-old and tell them to hammer away. Why? Because if they have not used a hammer before, especially a heavier one, they may cause damage to themselves, and to everything around them. 
thoroughly furnished means that they are completely equipped for the task ahead of you. And God is not going to give you more than you need. He will give you what you need, not, but not so much that you forget to fully still rely on him. In the Bible, God has provided for everyone the right amount of what they need. John chapter 20, verse 30 says, And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written, that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. You do not need further revelation from God. You do not need a new word from God. Everything that you need is right here in the scriptures. Is there more to know? Of course. God is infinite. And when we get to heaven, we will never stop learning more about him when we reach heaven. It's going to be glorious there. You know, Some people will think about heaven and think, oh, it's going to be boring. This is going to be the same thing every day. I'm thinking, no, <coughs> it's going to be wonderful because I'm going to be singing to him every day. I'm going to be learning more and more about him. It will never, ever change that way. And I will never run out of something new to learn about him. In the meantime, he has given you what you need for right now, and it is enough. And that's why it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Because it's going to mold us and shape us and make us into that pot that God wants us to be. That vessel that he wants to use. And he wants a vessel that he can use. And Jesus, so the Lord calls for his disciples to read and study the Bible. And that's what we're to do. He calls for us to do that. And, and you think about it, we're in a country now where you can go to any dollar store and find a Bible. It may be incredibly small print, but you can find a Bible. You know, I, uh, you can listen to audio Bibles. You know, you have, you have DVDs you can buy and, and put them in the machine and read the Bible on your TV. You know, so there's no reason to not be able to read your Bible. Go back to Romans for a moment. Romans 15, 4. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. And so when studying the Old and the New Testament, you will learn of many things and read about many men and women who were sinners too. The Lord did not just record in the Bible only the good things that men and women did or said. God included their sins. The men and women in the Bible were not perfect. They were sinful and some remained unrepentant. Others, you can read about their repentance toward God and learn from their examples. Keep your finger back in Romans. Go now to 1 Corinthians 10. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 6, Now these things were our examples, to the intent, that we, sh to the intent we should not lust after evil things, as they also lusted. So we read about these men and women in the Old Testament learning from their example of what not to do. Do not lie. Do not sell your brother into slavery. Do not murmur against God. Do not rebel against God. Do not arrange for the murder of your lover's husband. Do not show off your riches to the Babylonians. Do not break the Ten Commandments. And those are just a few examples of what we can learn from all of this. And go down to verse 11 now. Now all these things happened unto them for examples, for they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the earth are come. Be ready 
be ready to repent of your sins, because you have sinned against the Lord and your fellow man. And the scriptures are profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. They give you direction and guidance. The scriptures will give you wisdom and understanding so that you might not sin against God. And the scriptures will be a light unto your path. However, if you are in the dark and you have a flashlight, but never turn it on, then that flashlight is of little help to you. God has provided you with the scriptures and they will teach you doctrine and righteousness and they will correct you and reprove you when you are choosing to sin. But the scriptures will not give you wisdom and understanding if you never open them and read them. Just like that flashlight won't work if you don't turn it on. Or at least make sure it has batteries in it as well. Think of it this way. All scripture is not about me, but all scripture is for me. When you really think about it, there is no other book like the Bible. In the Bible, you will find the answers to all of life's important questions. And it is in the scriptures that you learn of man's beginning and who man is and who God is and what is man's purpose here on earth and in the future. The Bible tells of the future and what will be the end of man. It is a history book, a theology book, a book with poetry and songs. It is a book of guidance and wisdom, and it is a book that cannot be exhausted for the learning contained therein. It is everything that you need. Consider this, if there was only one book to have with you on a desert island, the Bible is exactly what you would need because you would never stop learning about God and about yourself, and you would never be bored with it. And yet people will say, oh, but I'd rather have Harry Potter books with me or this book or that book. This book, you can never exhaust it. There's always something new to gain from it. There was a, years ago, there was a young lady that worked at our store. And I've told this story before, but um, I found out she professing Christian and we would talk once in a while and um, she was excited because she was going to start teaching Sunday school. And I was already a bit concerned with her because she didn't show a whole lot of depth in knowledge. Now she was going to be teaching Sunday school. She was going to be teaching younger kids. And I said, have you read the Bible through once? She said, no. But that's okay. I'm going to be you know, I'm going to teach them the stories. I'll teach them about David and Daniel and, and, and the ark and all these things. And but how can you truly teach the Bible if, you've only, if you haven't even read it through once? And, and she was positive. She was going to be able to do it. And she was positive. But, but I am a Christian. See, I have tattoos on my wrist. And on my feet, where Christ had been crucified, I had myself tattooed there to remind me. That's, that's not how we do it. Faith isn't given by a tattoo. Faith is, is learned from the Word of God. Now, sad for that woman. I haven't seen her in a long, long, long time. So I don't know how it all worked out, but... Um, God gave us this book for a reason. We need to be reading it. <clears throat> Go back to chapter 15. Romans 15. We're done in Corinthians. Verse 4, the, the second half of it. That we, through patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. We all... Yes, I'm going to say it. We all need patience. We all have times where we must wait for someone or for something. But most of all, you are waiting for the hope of full salvation. That was what was so sad, talking with that woman. Is 
we don't have full salvation. And bear with me on this. We don't have full salvation yet. Keep your finger here in Romans 15. Go over to Romans 8. I know I didn't tell you that one, but Romans 8. Mm -hmm. Romans 8, verse 24. Romans 8, verse 24. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. You are a born-again believer right now. You've made that profession of faith in Jesus Christ and repented of your sins. You are a born-again believer right now, but you do not have full salvation yet until you have received your glorified body. That's the full salvation that I mean. It doesn't change that your relationship with God and everything else. I'm not saying that's not right. Our full salvation is when our bodies, we put off this corruptible flesh and put on incorruption, as it talks about in 1 Corinthians 15. Right now you have hope, but your hope is based on the unseen. Why? Because you walk by faith and not by sight. Your hope is founded upon Jesus Christ, and you will not see him until you pass from this life or the rapture occurs. There are people that say, oh yeah, I saw Jesus Christ, he was in my dream. No, he wasn't in your dream. Or I've seen Jesus Christ, or was it? Like, or, Robert's. Or, or, not Orson Roberts. Oral. Oral Roberts, thank you. Oral Roberts. He, he claimed to see a, a, a nine-foot-tall Jesus at the foot of his bed. No. Jesus doesn't do that. He doesn't do that. Our hope is founded on Jesus Christ, who we do not need to see. Your hope is founded on Jesus Christ, and you will not see him until you pass through the gates of death or the rapture happens. And when tribulations arise, as we just read, you must have patience during those trials. We must have patience and know that Jesus Christ will bring us through it. Romans 12, 12 tells us, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. That ties back into what we talked about in the first hour. Instant in prayer, that we are in such practice to prayer that when we need to pray for somebody or pray for something, we do it. We don't think about it and say, oh, you know, maybe I should pray. No, I just do it. That should be reflex, second nature for us. Those tribulations may be there for you to grow or to prune away the dead branches of sin in your life, or they may happen because of somebody else's, for somebody else's sake. God calls you to be patient during the tribulations because they will eventually end. The tribulations may not go as you expect, but they were always for your good. Think of Job. And God will bless. And even if your tribulation leads to you dying, heaven's not such a bad place to look forward to. Amen. You know, and I've said it more than once to people, you know, that at work and such that'll that'll say, but you might die. You can't threaten me with death. You can't threaten me with heaven. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's wonderful. Close my eyes in death. Open them to see my Savior. <laughs> Works for me. That's what we have to look forward to. And so the disciples of Jesus Christ were patiently awaiting for his return. Oh, you know what? We're done in Romans 8. We're still going to be in 15. We go over to James for a second. I meant to tell you this one. James chapter 5. <clears throat> James chapter 5. We're waiting for his return. James chapter 5, drop down to verse 7. And what does James say there? Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. 
Behold, the husband and husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he receive the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. The Lord Jesus Christ is coming soon. The scriptures promise it. You know, and even though 2,000 years ago, James says his coming is nigh, in God's timetable, nigh is any moment now. Because God doesn't work on the same clock that we work on. And so in the meantime, you are called to be watchful and waiting patiently for his return. You think about the farmer, he goes out, he plants his seed into the ground and then patiently waits for the seed to grow and to produce fruit. You cannot make the seeds grow any faster. You know, they may say on the Miracle Grow package, put one scoop for every X amount of feet or whatever it is. So putting in 10 scoops isn't gonna make that seed grow any quicker. We have to patiently wait. Now, <laughs> uh, we planted a catalpa tree in the front yard. I'm not sure how many years ago now it's been, but we look at it and I can see it from here and it's what probably eight, nine feet tall now. And we anxiously look forward every year to see the tree flowering each year. And there is little we can do to make it flower any quicker. It will flower at some point. We have, we, we have that hope, but we can't make it go any quicker. And we look forward to it, because when it does flower, it will be a beautiful smell to it. But in the meantime, we must be patient and hope that this will be the year it flowers. Come, what, end of May, beginning of June, that's usually when they will start to flower. So we look forward to that time. And if it doesn't flower this year, we'll have to be patient again next year. If Jesus Christ doesn't come today, we're patient. Maybe it'll be tomorrow. Maybe any day. We don't know when it will be. But we have the hope and the promise that he said he will be here. And so when you are becoming impatient in your day-to-day -day life, you may become tempted to do something sinful to pass the time more quickly. You may be tempted to be weary of always doing the right thing because your impatience wonders why you haven't been blessed yet. And even more so, not only your impatience, but also your pride has begun to wonder and doubt the promises of God. A trial falls upon you and you faint at the trial because you've become impatient. And what does it say? That we, through patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. It's back in Romans. Go back over to Romans. The scriptures teach you to be patient. And it is the Bible. It is the Bible that will reinvigorate your patience. It is the Bible that will strengthen you and help you to be patient. The Bible restores your hope. The scriptures give you comfort and they give you hope. All age groups can receive comfort from reading and believing the Bible. All economic levels will receive comfort from reading and believing the Bible. You don't need to get a Bible that that's, um, the English is aimed at just kids. They'll get just as much comfort from reading this and memorizing the King James as an adult will. And, and they can understand it just as an adult can. They just need to be taught. The Bible provides comfort in any situation and in any circumstance. Keep your finger again in 15. Go over to Romans 5 now. Romans 5, verse 3. Romans 5, verse 3. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also knowing that tribulation worketh patience. And you think about that for a second. It is the times of tribulation that grow you and grow your patience. But <sighs> tribulations could hurt. We don't look forward to pain. We don't look forward to, to discomfort and difficulty and everything else. But 
you think about, he says there, we glory in tribulations. Just as Paul and Silas, after being beaten and whipped and then locked in stocks in the center of the prison in Philippi, at midnight they're singing and praying to God. We glory in our tribulations. Uh, all right, keep going here. But we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. And patience, experience, and experience, hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. What happens? Patience, tri tribulations give you patience, because you know the tribulation will end. You have to wait for its end. You can't make it end any quicker. Because you know what? You try to take that shortcut, God will make it longer, quite possibly. And you won't have learned what you need to learn from it. And so you have the patience to bring you through it. And you will find that you will gain experience from these tribulations and building up your patience. And from that will then spring forth hope. It's, it's like going up a set of stairs. You can't get to the top stair unless you take all the other stairs first. It doesn't matter how long your legs are. You know, it's not going to be comfortable to try and stretch from the bottom step to the top step. You go step by step by step. And all of that will spring forth that hope. Hope in Jesus Christ. Hope knowing that he will take care of you and guide you when you humbly allow him to direct you. And for the lost soul, the Bible gives hope. The gospel of Jesus Christ gives hope to the lost. <clears throat> for in its pages, the sinner can know that they do not have to die in their sins. They can know that Jesus Christ died for their sins and that Jesus Christ conquered death and resurrected from the dead. What wonderful hope there is for the lost that they do not have to remain lost that they can repent and believe the gospel. And for the disciple of Jesus Christ, hope comes from the Bible. Faith grows by hearing and heeding the Bible. 1 John chapter 5, verse 13 tells us, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know, that ye may know that you have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. It's not a hope-so salvation as we think of hope. It is a no-so salvation. We know we are saved. We know we are saved. The Bible provides certainty of salvation, the certainty of being with Jesus Christ one day in heaven. There is the wonderful hope for the believer that Jesus Christ will never forsake them, as we read this morning in Hebrews 13. And it is all found in the Bible. Back to Romans 15 once more. Now the God of patience and consolation... Verse 6. Verse 5 and 6. Verse 5 and 6. <clears throat> now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another according to Jesus Christ Jesus, that ye may be with one mind and one mouth glorify God. I didn't say that right. That ye may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. You and I are called to be like-minded according to the Lord Jesus Christ. Not like-minded as, well, what do we all agree in? But like-minded in what the Word of God says. This is, again, that plumb line. Without sacrificing doctrine or truth or love, you are called to be like-minded with fellow believers. And it is Jesus Christ that equips you to be able to walk in the Spirit. And the key to all of this is humble submission to the will of God. Yielding to Jesus Christ. Not imitating Jesus Christ. Because an imitation is just that. 
It's not the real thing. <clears throat> All right, think of it kind of like this way, and it's you're gonna. And obviously, this is an analogy that's far below what Jesus Christ is. But let's say you go to a store, you want to buy a Twinkie. Okay, you want to buy a Twinkie. If you get the Hostess brand Twinkie, you're getting a Twinkie. But if you buy the store brand Twinkie, it's just not going to taste the same. Why? Because it's an imitation of the real thing. You know, you can go to the library and you can buy all, get all these books out that tell you how to make your own version of a Big Mac or your own version of Chick-fil-A chicken or all these other things. But you know what? It's still not the same thing. It's an imitation. God does not call us to be imitations of Jesus Christ. He calls us to be followers of Jesus Christ, to yield to Jesus Christ, to, to, to humble ourselves before him. When a person is born again, they are a new creation. There is a new life, and the believer can walk with Jesus Christ. <coughs> but to walk with someone is, means to walk following their pace. When a person is born again, they have Jesus Christ living in them, and they will walk accordingly and will do what will glorify God because they want to glorify God and because they love God. Therefore, when a group of like-minded believers gather together, they should be able to praise the Lord without difficulty and should be able to interact with one another because they all have Jesus Christ in common. Even if they have very little else in common, they have Jesus Christ, that should be enough to be able to then talk to each other. And how do we get to that point? Right here in this book. We get to that point through the scriptures. You grow in love for the Lord through the scriptures. You grow in faith through the scriptures. You grow in hope through the scriptures. And that's how we grow and walk with the Lord Jesus Christ every day is through the Bible. And that's what we then need to share with people. But we can't share it if we don't know it. And so we need to know it so well that we can share it easily and give them the answer for the hope that lies within us. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, again, I do thank you for this time with your word. And I thank you, Lord, for, for what we learn from your word. And I pray that you would help us to remember it and then use it in our lives today, tomorrow, forever. And to use it for your glory to use it to tell others about Jesus Christ and for a closer walk for us with Jesus Christ. Lord, I thank you that you have equipped us and you're willing to help us. And I pray, Lord, that we would be willing to submit to you and humbly ask for your help, ask for your wisdom, and rely on your strength, because our strength is nothing without you. And I pray, Lord, that as we go through this week, you would help us to reach out to others, to give them the gospel, to let them know of the truth that is Jesus Christ. And I pray, Lord, that You would prepare the paths ahead of us. Prepare the hearts of those that we talk to. Lord, that they would be ready to hear the gospel. That they would be ready to repent and believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you that you are there for us. That you care for us and love us. And I thank you. I thank you so much that you are so long so very long-suffering with us. And these things I pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen.